And welcome back to A Spirited Debate. Well, for many people, the person of Jesus Christ is a teacher of love, a benevolent being whose way of life should be followed. But N.T. Wright, a world-renowned biblical scholar and minister, says that for centuries, Christians have avoided the huge world-shaking challenge of Jesus' central claim. And as a result, the kingdom of God has been reduced to a private piety. Dr. Wright reveals his findings in his new book, Simply Jesus, a new vision of who he was, what he did, and why he matters. And Dr. Wright joins me now. Hi, good to be with you. Good to be with you, too. Thank you so much for joining us. So, You said if we really understood the claims of Jesus, that we would discover a much more larger, larger and probably much more disturbing person than we I imagine before. I think so. I think the last two centuries in the Western world, uh, the, the church and Western society as a whole have kind of colluded to, to diminish um, what we now call religion. And religion becomes something that you and I do with our solitude and mm -hmm. occasionally on Sundays or whatever we get together with other people to do it. But the, the claim of Jesus is that, uh, and the claim through Jesus, is that something happened at that moment through which the world was transformed. And the thing that happened was that God basically took charge of the world in a new way. And, and the blessed word theocracy comes up again and again. People get very scared about that. <laughs> like, theocracy sounds like mad clergy telling everyone what to do and threatening them with they don't. But Jesus says there's, there's a new way of God being king, and it looks like this, and he goes around having parties and healing people, etc. But then he deals with the stuff that is getting in the way of God being sovereign, being king, being in charge, ultimately through his death. And that that kingdom agenda, which reaches its climax in Jesus' death, means that from then on the world is in fact a different place, and that if people will only sign on and believe and join in this movement, then all sorts of things can happen which are much, much bigger than just you and me getting our spiritual lives together and maybe going to heaven hereafter. Well, this has wide implications then in terms of politics, uh, relationships, friendships, all of these things change then, and this is not the way a lot of the the modern world likes to look at it. Exactly. I think the modern world, especially the last couple of hundred years in your country and mine, have tended to say, well, the church can do its private thing, teach people how to say their prayers or whatever, and that's all very well, but we will actually run the world our way. And frankly, when you look at the way the Western world has run things the last 200 years, um, it's been very nice for some. It's been disastrous for many people, both in our own countries and around the world. And maybe a lot of people would be very glad to hear that actually God is in charge. And if we will get in tune with that, then things could be very different and very healing and very much more creative than we've allowed them to be. But there are a lot of people, and I you know, cover religion a lot. I hear this from people a lot. They want to view Jesus as a teacher of love. As I said in the intro, sort of mm -hmm. benevolent being. This is the... Um, <clears throat> the type of life you should follow, and that's what Jesus brought us. Yeah, yeah. But and you say this is not really that, true. That, that, no, that's true, but, that's it's true. Not, but it's not nearly enough. Um, when Jesus gave those wonderful things we call the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the meek, blessed are the mourners, and so on, we have tended to privatize this. If I am meek, if I am pure in heart, then God will bless me. But part of the point of those Beatitudes is that when God blesses, he blesses not only you, but through you. In other words, when God wants to change the world, people People say, oh, why, why doesn't God step in and stop the, the, the Holocaust or the tsunami or whatever? When God wants to change the world, he doesn't send in the tanks, he doesn't bully people. He sends in the meek and the poor in spirit and the brokenhearted and so on. And they change the world. And we've seen it in our own generation. Somebody like Desmond Tutu in South Africa. Mm -hmm. There's a man who was really could have been completely crushed by the system and often was being opposed by the left and the right and his own people didn't understand, etc. And through prayer and faithfulness, he and others around him radically transformed South Africa. Who would have thought we would see the changes that have taken place there? And there are many, many other examples which often don't make the headlines because this story doesn't fit with what uh, the newspapers and so on regularly want to talk about with the church. But actually, people are out there making an enormous difference, transforming the world. Mm -hmm. You know, there is a conflict between the sort of the, the, the historical Jesus and the Jesus of faith, and I think it's a, on, a, on, a, on a micro level, you can almost call it versus science versus, versus, well, versus theology. Well, it's very interesting because those polarizations are precisely things which we invented in the 18th century, and your society and mine have actually structured themselves around this, either this or that. Most of the world, through most of human history, hasn't forced things apart in that way, and I think it's time we jolly well put them back together again, because because God's creation is multifaceted, but it isn't polarized like that. And so whether it's politics and religion,
religion or science and religion or faith and history, mm -hmm. actually they belong together. And I don't believe in the separation of the Jesus of history and the Christ of faith. The Christ that I believe in is the Jesus who walked and talked in first century Palestine. Of course, rationalist historians can pontificate and say, well, we don't believe in miracles or we don't believe in resurrection or whatever. And say, well, actually, let's look at the evidence. Let's do proper history. Let's see what's going on there. And what does the evidence say about the resurrection? Because a lot of people say there are two. We don't believe in miracles, that, yeah. that no man could rise from the dead. Yeah, what, is yeah. the, what, is the, well, what do the facts actually say? Of course, say? people knew that in the first century just as much as we do. This is not a new scientific discovery. You know, people in the first century knew just as well as we do that dead people don't rise. Um, you didn't have to have Voltaire and Rousseau and Darwin in order to prove that. We knew that. The, the point about the resurrection is that in its own terms, it isn't a very odd event within the old creation. It is the paradigmatic event that launches the new creation. And that's the claim of Christianity. Not here is a nice new moral teaching or here's a new way to get to heaven or whatever. It's that God is actually doing something right there in the first century to launch a project which you can call new creation. And he does it in and through Jesus. And it bursts into the old creation, which is constantly surprising us with new possibilities and new hope. So it isn't a matter of saying, here's how the old creation works. Can we fit the resurrection into that? The answer is, well, that's really rather difficult. On the other hand, the evidence for the resurrection, even in those terms, is remarkably good. I, I've researched this at great length. If you look at all the other options for how you explain the rise of Christianity, one by one, they fall off the edge. They just don't do it. But if you say, supposing God raised Jesus from the dead on the third day, then all the other bits of evidence cluster around and say, yep, that makes sense. And then the challenge is, are you prepared to believe in a God who could do that and who would do that? And you have to forget two-thirds of the modern Western worldview, not in order to go back to some pre-modern worldview, but to go on to the future where God is trying to lead, lead us right now. now